is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after 11 is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we struggle and continue to struggle to come up with reasons to believe things will be better. And I, I, I was frustrated by the conversation with that MP for Yeovil before the news because they didn't say before the referendum that things will be worse in any ways. Nobody said that. Exact same benefits is what David Davis said. And I don't buy the idea, nor do most... Obviously, esprit de scalier is, is um, very easy to achieve, but you'd struggle to find a consensus in Australia that the deal they struck with America, it took 15 months to write, was an unalloyed good for them. But even if it was, the idea that leaving the largest single market in the world will render us better off by dint of a trade deal with Australia, who I think have already said that they would prioritise a trade deal with the European Union over us... Um, I, I, I'm going to say that if an elected MP is still really sounding no more informed or optimistic than my average callers, it's the most wonderful endorsement yet of my um, refusal to invite or my reluctance to invite people onto the programme as special experts because they don't actually know anymore. They're just a little bit more fluent, perhaps, and, and glib. But fair play to the fella, Marcus Fish, for, for picking up the phone and ringing in. And if it turns out that we can sign a deal with Australia that will plug... A significant proportion of the holes left in our international trade by leaving the European Union, then so be it. Still going to look for a few more reasons to be cheerful. We've got Mystery Hour coming up at 12. I, I, do you want to hear a mad conspiracy? Are you in the mood for a really mad conspiracy? No? All right, I may save it until later in the programme. Um, 03456060973 is the number that you need. And the question I will insist that you answer is, what is going to be better? And uh, yeah, well, the Australian-American deal has gone quite well, isn't really, with respect to my honourable friend, an answer to that question. Paul is in Gretna. Gretna Green. Morning, James. Hello, Paul. What's on your mind? I think you've ignored the key demographic who led the charge for Brexit, because they've got a positive Go on. coming their way. If you happen to be a multi-millionaire tax avoider, then leaving the EU means we avoid taking on the EU tax avoidance directive that comes out in March. Uh, do you know, when this first got... Fl this is a yet again, I don't know if you were listening at the very top of the show today, when uh, we, we sort of described the ignorance with which... I described the ignorance with which I walked into the voting booth, and I obviously cast my vote to remain, but it was by no means as, as clear a decision as it would be today. I didn't know stuff. So when this first started appearing, Paul, this claim that the easiest explanation as to why extremely wealthy people, whether they happen to own newspapers or hedge funds, are in favour of something that makes so little sense to the rest of us... Um, I, I thought this was some sort of, sort of red herring or conspiracy. Well, 80% of the media is owned by six people. No, you know I know that. But this notion that their, their attempts to cramp down on, on tax avoidance informs... I, see, I, I tell you why I disagree with you as it being the reason why they did it. Because they've been doing it for 30 years, and the announcements on tax avoidance are relatively recent. This is true, but... Um, they've been doing it since Boris Johnson arrived in Brussels as the Daily Telegraph correspondent and got more what we would today call clicks by filing rubbish about bananas than he did about filing reality. That's when everything changed. And that was years, decades, before anybody mentioned um, tax avoidance. Well, what led me to the conclusion was a, a graph I'd seen on somebody's Twitter feed. Yes. That just posted the number of anti-EU stories in the mainstream media. Yes. And, and at the date that uh, the tax avoidance measures were announced, there was a huge spike in anti-EU stories, and it carried on that way. And now that the reality should be biting, the reason why these newspapers won't respect their readers' livelihoods and admit that they've made a terrible mistake, then, then, then your theory kicks in, doesn't it? Because they, they don't want to go back on this, even though it's going to be bad for all of their readers, because it is arguably going to be good for them. Absolutely. I mean, I forget who said it, but politics is just like any other crime. If you want to know who did it, just follow the money. I'll tell you who said it. It was Cuba Gooding Jr. and Jerry Maguire. 
Was it? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Oh, no, that was show me the money. Oh, rats, I got it wrong. Anyway, nearly. Eight after 11. Oh, three, four, five, six, oh, six, oh, nine, seven, three. <laughs> yeah, you keep your language friendly, even if you are going to be rude on Twitter. Um, not to me. Adam is in Rochester. Adam, what have you got? Oh, hello, James. Uh, um, first time caller, a bit nervous, Don't quite be, excited. <laughs> really? Um, absolutely. Yeah, very much so. I listen to your show all the time. Good man. You are the antidote to the Brexit lies. No, 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 no. I need lies. reasons to be cheerful. OK, OK, right. This is my reason to be cheerful. I work in countryside access. Um doing the public rights away, so footpaths are out in the countryside, etc. Yes. When naughty farmers don't reinstate their public rights of way after they've ploughed over them, uh, I step in and then use enforcement by saying, look, if you don't reinstate your public right of way, then you're going to lose 3% of your common agricultural policy money. So this is part of the EU subsidies to yes. landowners so that they uh, don't they know, have set aside land for wildlife, etc. So the um, the fabulous Michael Gove has recently given a, a speech basically saying that in future landowners, uh, instead of just being given this money, willy nilly, i.e. like Saudi racehorse breeders or Her Majesty the Queen. Yes, uh, or James Dyson. Money. Yeah, or the lovely James Dyson, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, instead of just getting the money automatically, they'll actually have to do more to um, like work for the money. So... And, and, and I, I, you know, everyone who's still screaming at me for suggesting that I, I don't think Jeremy Corbyn would necessarily be a brilliant Prime Minister is now going to scream ever louder when I say, I can't get rid of my soft spot for some elements of what Michael Gove does because he actually tries to do stuff rather than just yeah. manage decline. That The problem with what you've told me is, uh -huh. I, I, are we 100% sure we couldn't have done this while we were still in the European Union? Because um, I read I one, like... I read one editorial that said this is a great move, but don't pretend that we couldn't have done it if we'd remained. Mm, I, I think we probably could have done um, if there'd been more impetus. Uh, but and I also think, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but I think that Gove is just words, not deeds. Oh, hang on! Um, I thought I thought you were ringing up to um, say this yeah, was a good I, idea. I'm, this I'm, is Gove's I'm idea. Trying... Yeah, I'm trying to say it's a good... I'm trying to come up with a good a good point. So, potentially, uh, what the lovely Mr Gove has said is that, you know, we could have better countryside access for the public and that money is going towards that or towards farmers and landowners that encourage that rather than going to people that have got loads of money anyway and don't really need any more. And that's that's probably the, the, the perhaps the reason to be cheerful, maybe. Yeah, no, I, I, I'll give you that. What, what what do you think is going on on on, on the broader stage? Uh, I, he rang in, and he is an MP, but I, I'm a little uncomfortable hitting him over the head repeatedly now that he's gone. But the the mindset of a, of an elected politician who can argue that leaving the largest single market on the planet, it, the largest single market ever, um, being the first country in history to sign a free trade agreement that will actually equip us to do less free trade with the other signatories to that treaty can somehow be alleviated by some slightly over-optimistic analysis of an American trade deal with Australia. I, 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 I mean, I say this with love of my fellow man. How does someone end up in a hole that deep? It, it, it beggars belief. I mean, I suppose it's kind of like the situation where, you know, you can convince someone, you can you can present someone with all the facts um, and account their arguments. But it's, you know, it's like you said before in other shows, it comes down to emotion almost. Um, and also, it, it, perhaps with this chap in Yeovil, he's towing the party line. I mean, I... I mean, he's I, not I mean, towing he, the party line because Ed Vasey on, on Channel 5 the other day spoke truth and spoke about there's a complete decline uh, in discipline. There's no discipline in the party. That's why she can't punish anybody for doing things that would have got them fired in any previous cabinet, whether you're talking about Boris Johnson or... or um, is that deputy chairman being fired yet? The one who, who, who libeled Jeremy Corbyn and had to retract it and apologise in a humiliating Probably fashion? Probably not. Probably yeah. not. So there's Probably no... Not, it's right. all gone through the window. And the, and the off-the-record briefings that you now get from almost everybody on the in the sensible benches, is that, that, that Theresa May has a choice. She either destroys the country by pressing on with it or she destroys the party by stopping it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would like to say that um, I, I pray, I pray every day that Jacob Rees-Mogg comes on your show that you, so you can take him apart. For his well, I don't know that I can audience. take him apart. I don't know that I would. I don't know that I could. I spoke to him before the... Um, uh, referendum when I was I still that, yeah. tr still trying to wear my BBC hat and not I was looking for, for information and not having debates and not having arguments but he speaks in a way that 
I, I, I don't know. He, he'll mention something from 1763, and I won't know what it is, and, and I mm. won't then be able to. So I just I talked to him about why he's tweeting economic analysis out of the Sun that the Sun have withdrawn, while claiming that the economic analysis of his own government is absolutely bogus. That that's all I'd want to know from him. How come mm. you are saying thank you to the Sun for this economic? prediction that says we're going to be really, really well off and then the Sun have to withdraw it from circulation because it's so utterly bovine, ignorant and wrong, but he still um, leaves it up there. And how can you be in favour of that demonstrably wrong stuff while dismissing your own government's projections? There's the question that other people can ask him when he, and, when he pops and, and, up. And this, and this is one of the reasons why I tune in, because you deconstruct the double talk and the double think. You know, what you did with the lovely Mr Farage um, in that interview, where his, his guy had to pull him out of the interview. I mean, that was, that was fantastic. The yeah, way, well, it was a bit pantomime, though, wasn't it, mate? It was, it was, it, an, it early, was, it was an early point, indication yeah. of, of how pointless it was fighting facts with feelings because if the feelings run deep enough and they're nasty enough then the people feeding them can do no wrong I, I just you know have a look at proper politicians and have a look at pantomime politicians you've got pantomime politicians now essentially in, in in poland in hungary in america thankfully we haven't got any in positions of power here but i tell you what never say never thank you for the kind words um i, I suppose we now have to put someone on to tell me that i'm absolutely awful in the interest of balance at all how awful am i on a scale of one to ten <laughs> uh, yeah, seven eight yeah there we go that'll do what do you want to say oh, i'm so frustrated james i'm normally a listener not a caller so um well, i am really... short of time so fascinating though it is to understand your own personal psychodramas give, give me the reasons to be cheerful about leaving the european union okay we'll realize what we missed once we've left well oh, that's not helping you're doing the Joni mitchell we won't know what we've got till it's gone <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the frustrating thing is, um, if it's like you having a job, and then you th you're really unhappy with the conditions, you think, oh, it's better in another job. You go there, and then you realise, blimey, I had something much better previously. Um, yes. But what, what, what really frustrates me is, um, it was a 52 to 48. Now, the younger generation, when you did the analysis, were more remain. So in 15 years, for example, we have another referendum, have a huge cost of coming back in. It's well, absolutely ridiculous. You know that and I know that. And I, I suspect that we now have to, because I'm not getting the calls I used to get from um, angry people um and that is not because they haven't got the nerve to ring in or anything like that it's because as i think alex and leon c you can't still be angry you can't apart from that one fella um he was still banging on about um the left behind and uh, people not being heard but he began by saying he'd taken a 30 to 40 percent hit to his own business and he's turning around to people who can't scrape together 17 million people in this country who can't lay their hands on 100 quid and he's saying yeah they might be bad they might be worse off economically but it's worth it because they'll feel listened to apart from that level of idiocy or the claim that uh, an american deal with australia can somehow replace our membership of the biggest single market in the world. I just want to get into the psychology now. I just want to understand mm -hmm. how anybody can listen to Theresa May last week and Donald Tusk this week and still think that the unicorn's going to turn up by tea time. We, I mean, we, well, we have to believe in democracy. The only issue we, I've got is we should have had the two-thirds majority for us to make a decision like this, which is big. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and, and I, I, I mean, I, I, I balk at that, but I'm, I will only use myself as an example. I'm not casting aspersions on anybody else's qualifications to have cast a vote in that refer referendum, but um, I'm casting aspersions on mine. I shouldn't have been allowed near that polling booth until I'd undertaken about six months' worth of revision and information. Um, and I have to apologise. You're absolutely right, Ash. Ash has been in touch via Twitter at Mr James OB to say, how can you say there are no pantomime politicians in the United Kingdom within minutes of giving Boris Johnson a coating on air? You're absolutely right. Oh, no, you're not. This is LBC. This is LBC with James O'Brien. It's 21 minutes after 11 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, it's International Women's Day. I don't think we've had any female voices on the programme yet. So can we rectify that? Can we get rid of a couple of these calls and uh, encourage women to ring in and talk to us about the latest developments regarding Brexit? And, and I, th I think you can tell today from my tone, from my general demeanour, that I'm... I'm I'm casting around now. I, I genuinely believe that we've set fire to our own home. 
Uh, and now, I think all responsible patriotic people should be trying to minimise the damage. Unfortunately, there are, and this is my interpretation of events, you've still got people standing outside, arsonists, insisting either that the house isn't on fire at all, or that when it's actually burnt down to the ground, it will be magically replaced by a magnificent palace, demonstrably superior to the one that we had before. 22 minutes after 11. That's the line, I think. Demonstrably superior to what we had before. Superior. So when David Davis said exact same benefits, we probably should have smelt a rat. So what's the point of doing something so big and costly and divisive if we're going to end up with the exact same benefits that we had before? And now his Prime Minister has conceded that we won't. And Donald Tusk has reluctantly accepted that position because, as he says, I, I understand why she has to do this at any cost. She has to pretend that it's a good idea, otherwise her party falls to pieces. These strike me as, as inalienable facts. They really do. And when you begin to wonder whether perhaps you've swung too far in that direction, you get a call from a former UKIP member who arranged uh, a fishing-based anti-EU demonstration a couple of years ago, and he calls you up to tell you that he's changed his mind. So, and, and look, I fully accept lots of people listening will go, oh yeah, I bet he did, it was probably your mate. Um, and you're perfectly entitled to think that, but if you're now shoring up your own political position by imagining that I invite fake callers onto my program to say fake things, if that's ha where you've ended up, oh, come on, mate. You really probably should wake up now. It's 24 after 11. Shane's in Fulham. Shane, reasons to be cheerful. Hello, mate. Um, no, I apologise for not being a female. You could um, have pretended. <laughs> Listen, yeah, we, we, do, we do have reasons to be cheerful. Um, and uh, the, I wanted to call in to tell you about the, back in the, the days of apartheid in, in my country. The, uh, the world decided to cut us off. Um, and we had uh, no one wanted to trade with us. They wanted us to, to punish the country, but instead of punishing us, it actually gave the country the chance to boost the economy. Local businesses took off like crazy. It's not always international trade and these globalists are not always good for the, for, for, for the economy of the country. Um, I think this will now give local businesses a chance to pick up and to boost the economy. Um, there's more how, reasons to be how? cheerful. There's a lot of reasons to be cheerful. There's yeah, don't just keep saying that. Tell me how. Now, now we know how desperate they are to fish in our waters. We can use this as a bargaining chip. We can say to them... But the whole referendum was, was fought on, on them fishing in our water. It was, all, it was all they had. But go on, we'll use that as a bargaining chip. We'll say what? We'll say, you fish in our waters and we'll take our borders back. Because at the moment, the borders are our number one priority. Mate, you, were telling me about an you were telling me about how we'd have an economic recovery that was locally sourced, and now, now you're talking about borders. Well, we, so we, tell me about the improvements reasons. to our local economy using sanctions era South Africa as our guide. Crikey, I thought the American Australian parallel was eccentric, but okay. So what what can we learn from sanctions era well, apartheid I'm South taking, Africa? I'm just taking lessons from history. We so, well, I'm taking lessons from you. So so how 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 will our economy improve as a result of of leaving the European Union, which is what you just told me would happen? Well, if they if if they don't want to trade, if if certain corporations, if multinationals don't want to trade with us, and we have the the, the local means of of production, then we can we can supply and and we and, and can we, can we, we put can some flesh on demand. this bone? I mean, the kind of thing you're thinking of. That the, I mean, bearing in mind multinationals, you mean companies rather than countries, but if they decide it's less attractive to to trade here or to to manufacture here than it would be in the world's largest single market, we can plug that gap and replace those jobs by doing what? By manufacturing for us, by, by, by self-sustaining. Just on, only using stuff that, that we don't have to import? Exactly. So what sort of manufacturers do you have in mind, Shane? Well, Britain's full of good talents. 
Well, I, I, yes, that, that's an interesting selection of, of, of words, but it, none of them answer the question I asked. What, what kind of manufacturing do you envision us being able to lead the world at without importing anything and that we're not currently doing? So we, we don't, we don't, we're not manufacturing anything? Manufacturers... No, no, the, 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 the stuff that we're currently doing is irrelevant to your vision. Your vision is of the stuff we're not currently doing, but big multinational companies are that we'll be able to do on a local basis without importing anything. I'm just, just wondering what... what you had in mind. Well, uh, well, I don't know, James, but I'm well, trying to give one. you reasons to be um, ch to to be cheerful. Yeah, we we're getting our laws back, we're getting our borders back. No, but we always we had our laws, our and we we back. always had our borders, and we always no, had we our. Never. Well, no, okay, we never. okay. We, we, well, we, as I said, I'm not going to have old hackneyed arguments about empty slogans today. I'm talking specifically about the economic impact of this political decision, which you say will have positives, and I am very politely pointing out that so far you've been unable to name a single one. Might not, James. It might not, James, but it might do. I can't tell the future, and neither can you, but I don't think there's any reason to be pessimistic here. I think it's Well, hang on. It's it's Theresa May it's and it's Donald Tusk have both said that the economic impact will be negative. The government's own modelling has, in some areas, four times the negative impact of the last recession, largely in the poor areas that voted leave. So I appreciate that economic impact assessments aren't crystal balls by any stretch of the imagination, but your reason to be cheerful is that we will be able to replace what is currently done on the international stage with local manufacturing and I was just hoping you'd say something like bicycles well James I did say what well, I did say to you that Britain's full of talent and I don't I might not need to name them individually but there's a lot of talent in Britain there's a no, lot this is it and, and, and of course not only the, bicycles the point you miss of, of course is that you're supposed to be explaining to me how leaving the European Union would increase the amount of talent in Britain. Well, James, I'm just trying to tell you that there, there are there are reasons to be cheerful. It's not I haven't heard one yet, doing. Shane, and I've, I promise you, I've been listening really closely. Well, we were well. South Africa was cut off from the rest of the world, and the economy boomed. It, well, so unfortunately, history suggests the that the economy didn't boom. Well, but anyway, all right, I'll take that. So, so the reason to be cheerful is that if we're lucky, we'll be like apartheid-era South Africa while it was suffering from international sanctions. That, that's our sunny upland. Not at all, not at all. That's I, exactly I, what you said. Not, I, I, that's not what I said at all. What okay, what do you think you said? Being, being protectionist can sometimes uh, be an advantage to the economy. And, and which leading British politician has suggested that we should be protectionist as opposed to outward looking and doing more trade with the rest of the world? Well, leaving the, leaving the EU is certainly a protectionist move. But all, the people, all the people that have promoted it have said it will free us up to do more trade with other countries. You heard the Conservative MP talking about Australia a minute ago, closer to your home country than it is to mine. So just to recap, and, and I'm, 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 as I said, no arguments, no shouting today. You think that we should look at apartheid-era South Africa as a reason to be optimistic about leaving the European Union, and you think that we can replace a lot of what is currently done on the international manufacturing stage in this country with locally sourced manufacturing, but at the moment, and I appreciate it's a pressured environment when you ring a radio station, at the moment you can't think of a single example of what kind of sector that might involve. Well, all the doom and gloom is not always, it doesn't always turn out so bad. Protectionism can sometimes have advantages for the economy. I don't have a crystal ball. Give yeah, you. now, now, now you're just repeating yourself. So we'll agree that that's what you've said. Look, look to apartheid era South Africa as a shining example of what we could hope for in our, in our best case scenarios, and we'll be okay because of manufacturing. Although I can't think of a single example of what we might manufacture more effectively than we currently could. Learn lessons from history. Not, yes. Not so, burn, in history, burn, can you burn, think burn. from history of an example of anyone ever signing a free trade agreement that reduces the amount of free trade they can do with their co-signatories? Well, it, it, as it stands right now, we're taking the borders back, we're taking our but, laws but, back. But now you're just being a parody of a, of a, of a sort of Brexit half-wit. You're just saying words. We don't, know, we don't know what's going to happen with the economy. We can, we yeah, can but, but, mate, the question was not... The question was simple. You said learn lessons from history, so I asked you to refer me to a free trade agreement signed by signatories who would be free to do less trade than before. 
Uh, no, James, I'm not a politician. I'm just. You're saying. not a politician, you're not a historian, you can't see the future, you can't answer any of my questions, but you think that we should look to apartheid era South Africa. Just high five, Shane. Seriously. 11.32, Simon Conway has the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 11.37 is the time. This from Max. I think at Mr. James O'Billity's, um, at Mr. James O'B's ability not to shout, you're a bleep idiot. You have no idea what you're talking about every time a Brexiteer phones in. Especially that South African caller is truly astonishing. I wish I had that level of restraint. Um, well, practice makes perfect. 11.38 is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. As not for the first time, we attempt to find out what will be better than it is now. And the answer is nothing. So why are we doing it? Julie is in Frankfurt. Ha happy International Women's Day, Julie. Well, thank you so much. And you very are an international nice woman. Too. How very apt. It's fantastic. <laughs> what do you want yeah, to say? I've, I've uh, lived and worked in the EU for many, many years. I was at the Nouvelle Sorbonne in 1974, where I met Emma Thompson. Um, I've worked since 1999 as a head of five international schools. I have a little insight into what goes on in living and working in the U EU. Well, so do we. Um, yes, we do indeed. But are you aware that in the EU... In you, you know, we are country, still... I still I've, I've lived my, pretty much my entire life in the EU. Well, it, it, I, think, I believe it's in the United Kingdom. Which is in the European Union, Julie. Well, fair enough. So I've lived oh, in an quickly, other What sort area of schools did you teach in? <laughs> are we splitting hairs now, or are on, we on, on whether or not uh, whether or not the United Kingdom is in the European Union? No, no we're not. We're splitting hairs. It's, 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 I don't understand. The, you're sort of claiming you've got a special perspective because you live in the European Union. Yes, I do. Because yeah, I but know so what do I. When you, oh, do you really? So you know what happens <laughs> in Switzerland, Italy, Germany, France. Every time you move round, exactly what you have to do. I, I, I have visited all of those countries. I have visited all of those countries. West years London. Have pontificated on just about everything outside your sphere. Um, what's the, what's the right answer? Yes or no? Well, do you know what happens if you move to a European country to live and work? Um, yes. Okay, tell me what happens. Well, you start off in one country, and then you move to the other one, and then you live and work there. Oh, uh, uh, under freedom of movement. Style. Under Do freedom you understand of understand about <laughs> registration. Well, the, the rules the rules are different from country to country. No, it isn't necessarily different. Switzerland but but it is. is different. Yes. But in France, Italy, and Germany, there's a different process. Uh, well, precisely. That's what I meant by different. People, oh, oh, do listen for a change, James. <laughs> listen to somebody who knows what they're talking about. Five minutes ago, you were under the impression that the United Kingdom wasn't in the European Union, headmistress. No, I wasn't at all. You, you called it splitting hairs. Not at all. No, OK, I mean, let's you're start again. you being pathetic now. Yeah, I, you're right, I apologise. You are being pathetic. I completely I mean, agree. When you get a female caller, you absolutely love that opportunity to just... You've got me. There, bang bang to rights, because all the male callers that I've had today, we've rolled out the red carpet and tickled them under the chin. Absolutely. I couldn't absolutely. agree more. That South African chap before, I couldn't have been more sycophantic to him if I tried. Right, let's, let's get down to facts. And, and stop this silly school playground business going on at well, the moment. Well, that's, that's your comfort zone, not mine. Uh, oh, really? I suggest you listen. When well, you have you to talk. When you move to a country outside the UK, whether in Europe or Switzerland or Norway... Switzerland's in Europe, so is Norway. ...to register... They're both in Europe. ...a local authority, which means they know who you are, where you are, and exactly what you're doing in the country. In, in, in England or in the United Kingdom, you're not required to do that. So it's a British government rule rather than a European Union rule? I, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's a British make. government decision you not to properly... down <laughs> a little bit and stop being a chicken little and just <sighs> listen to people who know what they're talking about. Do you know what? I, you I'm going to. Something. I'm going to listen to people that, I'm talk that know what they're talking about. I'm not sure you're one of them, but I'm, I'm going to be quiet for two minutes now I've and just let you Europe, speak. Go. I've lived in Europe for, since 1999. So have I. I suggest I know far more about what's going on in Europe than you do. But I've lived in Europe since 1972. Oh, bless your little heart. And I've lived in it since 1956. Fantastic. And I remember the ERM collapse. 
And I remember all the pre-1975 um, politicians and everything that was going on then. Yes, I, 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 I bow to your knowledge of the politicians and everything oh, that was going so on then. Because you weren't born, and you are really a very arrogant little man. I'm six foot one. Oh, well, I'm five foot six. Take me on. Well, at what, Julie? Who you know? Oh, Chess? You like. J- J- Julie, argument. I, I, I bear you no malice. I bear you no ill will. But I'm, I'm going I'm, to, I am going to stop you from embarrassing yourself further with the greatest of, of affection and regret. I've got no idea why you rang me. No idea at all. We, when we, we, we tire ourselves out explaining how immigration rules were a Westminster decision rather than a European Union imposition. I don't know why you're in such a foul mood. If it's anything to do with me, I apologise, and I hope your day is on the up from this moment onwards. And happy International Women's Day. Matthew is in High Wycombe. Matthew, what have you got? Um, James, well, first of all, um, I'm South African, hopefully soon to be a British citizen, and I'd like to apologise for the idiot who called in earlier. No, no, we don't need to call call him an idiot, and you don't need to apologise for him any more than I need to take personal responsibility for Julie's contribution to the programme. We're we're, we're individuals and we are together. What do you want to say? Okay, well, well, just touching on what he said before, though, he's completely wrong, not not even just from a... you know, apart say in the 80s was was doing okay. Um, I dealt with manufacturers who lived through that, and the only ones who made money were the people who were helping the racists cut corners, get around the laws. So it was a disaster for the country. Anyway, moving on. Moving um, on. Positives. I think that there's a good chance that the right wing in the country is going to screw up Brexit so far that they will discredit themselves for a generation, and maybe. There'll be a left-wing government. They'll start making some good decisions for the country. Oh, well, um, maybe they'll, make, they'll be a left-wing government and they'll make some bad decisions. No, no, no. I, I agree, but I think um, hopefully the likes of Jake Sabrice Mogg and um, uh, Boris Johnson will be completely discredited. Although they mm. do seem to be made out of Teflon. Well, and, uh, and, and of course, the, you know, they're, they're both. Uh, the, Rhys Mogg's dad was an editor of the Times. Boris Johnson is. <clears throat> Uh, still writing for the Telegraph. Uh, you know, you only really get your comeuppance in this country if the press barons decide that you deserve it, and I can't see that happening with these guys. But but give me some something to be upbeat about, if you can. Sure. Well, I mean, I do think the um, people who work in refrigeration of fresh fruit and vegetables will be doing quite well out of Brexit. Um, someone's going to need to make sure the fruit doesn't go off, so there's a, there's a silver lining somewhere. No, you're being sarcastic, Matthew. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I've heard it's a British trait. So it is a British trait, and you're, you're adopting it very well. The, the, I've got mates in the greengrocer um, business, and, and one of the first, I mean, that's why this, the tariff-free element of what, what mm. Donald Tusk said yesterday was was better in some elements than, than what some people have hoped for. But under the government's own economic analysis, it's, it's going to be an sure. 8% impact in parts of the north of England because, well, you know why, yeah. all of these well, things. James, I'm, I'm stealing a bit of your time, but I, very, very quickly, I worked in shipping for a year before the stress almost killed me in South Africa. And basically, I made a bit of a boo-boo on something that gotten stuck. It was uh, 40 tonnes of apples. And it, it sat for an extra week it shouldn't have. But yeah. what that meant was that the price of the whole container went down by half. Wow. Which meant that the people who shipped it to the UK had, had just lost money completely. It was a dead loss. They, they were out by 60 grand local. Now, it'll be the worst for berries or worse for cherries or whatever it is that you make in the, the UK in a shipping, say, to France. So there, there'll be some farmers and some some suppliers of fruit who will be absolutely terrified right now. You can't just say, oh, the next three days we'll ship it to America, it's going to be fine. It's not. It's just not like that with fresh goods. Maybe with meat and fish it's a little bit different. Uh, how, well, how bad will the border checks be? Because uh, tariff-free is good, but point-of-origin customs checks might not be quite as stringent as you suggest. I, I don't know, but what I'm saying is, is if you have lettuce and, and previously you flogged it to France... Yes. I mean... There are, I know, you do it, I do. We look at the milk and we go, oh, three, three days to go. I'll have yeah. the one that, that's going to last me five days. And sure. it's the same with lettuce. It's, and people get charged for stuff sometimes that isn't sold as well. Um, people who supply into supermarkets, that's not known a lot. That you know, if, if not all of your goods are sold, sometimes the supermarket just doesn't pay you for, for what goes off. It's, 
it's a common trick. So there are probably some very, very scared farmers and people in the food business right now. Can't say anything about it, of course. But um, Well, the farmers are beginning to, actually, the, 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 in the same way that the fishermen of Grimsby have sent a delegation to Westminster asking if they can continue their trading agreements and arrangements with the European Union. But, of course, the European Union turned around, as Donald Tusk did yesterday, and said, yeah, of course you can, as long as we can continue our fishing arrangements in, in British yeah. coastal waters. And that, well, that then, seems to be the yeah. kind of walnut that no one can exactly. crack. Well, now, now, now the... The wheels are really hitting the road. The thing is, no one who's actually got skin in the game in, say, fish or fresh fruit or whatever, is feeling cheerful. They might, might be brave and say, well, we'll make a hash of it. But it's the people who are in industries where all the money can just hop the border, no problem. You know, we can... We can yeah, I, well, I know, and we can do this and we can manufacture that. And your compatriot, um, uh, confident that we can... We can ape all the benefits of apartheid era South Africa when you had a sort of racially selective oligarchy um, in that country, not an economy that bears any comparison with a with a free liberal democracy. 11.48 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.52 is the time. A lot of you have wondered about poor old Linda who rang us the other day as we were talking about noisy neighbours. Um, there are wheels turning. Um, one listener has galloped to her rescue. We're keeping a very close eye on things. Things haven't improved as much as we hoped they might have done by now, but there are wheels turning and we're doing our best to help her. I know that you had a, um, a, a very big response to that call, and I'm not surprised because I was trying not to giggle when the noise started. It was, she rang in to tell me how, how, how noisy her neighbours were, and I thought she was probably exaggerating slightly. And then the drilling started, and it was genuinely like having someone in here with a full-on pneumatic. Uh, and then that initial sort of two or three seconds, you know, when it's half laughing, half shock. And then after that, luckily I didn't. I just, this is outrageous. So I said to myself on the radio while talking to Linda, this isn't funny. It was awful. And, and hopefully we, we'll be able to help her. Uh, come to some sort of improvement on that. Um, I'm not sure there's any help at all for Julie in Frankfurt, but thank you for all your kind words about that call. Let's go to Copenhagen next. Wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen. Anton is there. Anton, what would you like to say? Oh, well, that was faster than I thought. Um, OK, well, I, 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 I don't really... Be I don't believe in what I'm going to say, but I'm hoping you can help me. That South African guy inspired me a little bit. Which one? I think what he was... The, the, the guy that said that protectionism was maybe a good thing. OK. So, so, so maybe what he's trying to say is that if we come out of we, we I'm in Denmark now, but I'm from Norfolk. If we come out of the EU, um, then perhaps all these, you know, small businesses like, like you hear on Clive Bull's, biz, you know, business yes. bell on on Mondays and and on Dragons Den, maybe all of these small companies will be able to that are manufacturing in the UK will be able to sell to the internal market, and there'll be a bigger market for them. And maybe, I don't know, maybe Mars bars, will be, there'll be a demand for normal-sized Mars bars again, so they'll have to open factories in the UK to cater for the UK I'm, market. I'm not sure you're taking this. Are you taking this entirely seriously? Well, I mean, I'm, I hope you would help me a little bit. Well, I, OK. I, I, I mean... I think I'm trying. I'm no, trying. I know you are. I know you are. It's, it, it's stuff that you and can't currently do. So we could make toasters that, but then we wouldn't be able to export. I guess so you're talking about people who actively don't want foreign markets, who well, will be able to. Not they don't want them, but maybe just small domestic. Um, so we, we can cut our cloth according drugs. according to the problem with that is that if we are to look at the detail of what May and Tusk have said in the last week, I don't know that we'd be able to... I suppose we can manufacture stuff here that doesn't meet EU regulations as long as we don't try and export it. Exactly. OK. Most of the oh, EU regulations, are, are when you look at them, I and mean, there's probably too many of them, no-one is, is arguing that they're flipping infallible, but certainly when I, when I swatted up on the Hoovers, that lots of people got very worked up about for reasons that they always struggle yeah, to explain. Yeah, yeah. Yada yada. When I when I looked that up, the reason behind it was was actually to um, improve the air that we breathe, the environment, and the, obviously the consumption of energy without having any noticeable impact on the uh, suction powers of your of your vacuum cleaner. So I mean, Hoover's would most obviously fit some of the parameters you've set, but. I can't think of anything else. Some... We could have a global market for, you know, super powerful um, uh, vacuum cleaners. I mean, there must be a demand for that out there. Yeah, except we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't be able to sell them to the largest single market on the planet. Oh, well. 
<laughs> and, and I think I think the Mars factory, the mythical Mars factory of your dreams, would probably be in Holland, like HP sources now. But can I can I just say one thing now Anything. on my normal hat? Yes. Um, you know, I'm in the EU. I've lived half my life in the EU, well, more than half my life in the EU. I've been in Denmark now for 17 years. Yes, and, so, so um, have I. I'm, I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a Brit, and whenever I hear people saying the EU are doing this and the EU doing that, I get quite offended because that's us. That's just people representing us. That's yes. not a, a Donald Tusk or a or a Juncker or whoever it is. That is just people saying... And when they say, oh, they sell far more to us than we sell to... Yeah, but that's collectively. Yes, I know. Individual countries that, that, that... It's not a Donald Tusk or a Juncker or, or whoever they're called. Why do you always get nervous when you do this? That's, that's one for Mystery Hour. But it's like the... It, it, well, you just, you just, I'll tell you what happened then when you gulped. You just re remember that there, that there are a million people tuning into this program every week. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Plus people in Denmark. Countries. You don't get counted. Yes, I know, I know yeah. this, but this is the thing psychologically, and we'll do this another day. I thought we might do it today. Um, the psychology is, is one of en enmity, and that's what I think people like you and me can't quite understand, is, is that if you see the European Union as an enemy that wishes you harm, then you can understand how people were persuaded into voting against it without really knowing much. And then as evidence emerges after you've done that, that actually they're not an enemy to their members, they're an incredibly um, effective protector of their members' interests, then you can't quite square that. Do you see what I mean? But but this is the, the this is the post-war thing that, that I don't want to be dismissive of or or, or, or or say bad things about because one prominent Eurosceptic who I know very well lost his father in the Second World War and I, I believe that his politics have been informed by that experience ever since. And so it's all very well for me at 46 to turn around and say, oh, get over it. But if you perceive it as an enemy... And then all of this journalism that's been put into pr pr proving that it's an enemy. That's why people on Question Time end up talking about bananas. Because they can't actually come up with any evidence that it's an enemy or that it's a negative influence on their lives. Immigration, I suppose, is the easiest thing to pretend has negatively impacted on people's lives. But I don't see it as an enemy, so I can never get inside that mindset. And I suspect that you in Copenhagen can't either. Uh, George is in Battersea with the final attempt... At a silver lining. Georgie, what's it going to be? Hi. Um, right. It's a slightly melancholy reason to be cheerful. Um, so I'm 23 years old. I've recently graduated from uni. Yes. Um, I was actually a politics student. That okay. I've honestly always avoided UK government politics because I find it so boring and <laughs> so repetitive. Yes. Um, but actually, for me, I think that. Brexit, it was almost a warning sign, you know, not all that not all was well in the UK. Yes. There's so much inequality, so many people are really quite annoyed and fed up with the way that things are. And I think that the UK government can use the tragedy of Brexit to actually address the inequalities and the neglect. Well I think a Labour government would UK. a Labour government would try to. Um, I, 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 shall, I shall offer that olive branch to all my infuriated um, Corbyn listeners, yeah, Corbyn fan I mean, listeners. Obviously, it's going to be a lot harder outside of the EU because of restricted economic growth, well, uh, yes. all of the sad things that everyone's talking about. Except but also, Marcus I think Fish. that it's quite nice because it's actually almost in, like there's so much more political engagement. It's getting younger people into politics, like the um, Our Future, Our Choice. You it is, and, 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 and it is um, a silver lining of sorts, and you can tell by the music in the background that we're, we're heading towards the end of the hour. But, of course, the people you describe as, as being dispossessed, left out, left behind, the, the people with the least, the people who are poorest, um, are uh, under every assessment, and I accept they might all be wrong, but under every single assessment, they're the people that are going to be hit the hardest. The people that are going to be hit the lightest? Londoners. On FM, online on your mobile and on digital radio. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC.